many of our subscribers don't see our videos, make sure that you click the notification bell. And if you haven't already, follow us on social media for tips, tutorials, giveaways, and daily inspiration. This video is made possible by our loyal Patreon supporters. Visit patreon.com. Hello and welcome to the Wellness Plus podcast. I'm your host, Karina Rachel, and I'm joined today by Brad Swale of peoplesrx.com. So he is on the carnivore diet for over a year now, and he's going to be talking to us today about why he chose this diet and a little bit more detail for anyone who's potentially interested in trying out a carnivore diet. So Brad, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Definitely. So I think it's really interesting that you um, actually grew up in a family with more of that holistic health perspective. Yeah. Um, and your dad is actually the founder of peoplesrx.com, or here in Austin, we just call it People's Pharmacy, Yeah. Uh, which I personally love. I go there all the time. It's a great place to find any kind of natural health products and, of course, lots of juices and foods and all kinds of wonderful things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean to be clear, so it's People's Pharmacy is a um, it's a brick and mortar first and a website second, and okay. you know as as we grow and stuff like that, we're trying to increase our online presence, you know, hence my show and stuff like that, which we can you know maybe talk about uh, yeah. you know, as we go on. But yeah, he started the business back in I think I don't know. Some people say 1980, others say 1981. I don't know which one it is to be <laughs> honest. I think it's 81, but. Um, and it's a, yeah, it's a holistic wellness pharmacy. You can still get your oxys if you have a prescription, mm -hmm. you know, um, and you know, on top of that, on the floor, we have wellness professionals from, you know, uh, naturopathic doctors, chiropractors, um, acupuncturists, just general wellness specialists mm -hmm. that are there to help you find, you know, more natural solutions to your health problems. Right. Yeah. So I think it's really interesting, you know, for a lot of us that are now in the in the realm of natural health or holistic health, we kind of stumbled onto it yeah. in some way. Can you talk about what it was like actually growing up in a family, being kind of raised uh, by people who are already aware of nutrition and kind of this idea of living more naturally? Yeah. Well, um, Geez, that's a that's it's maybe less um, fantastical than you might think. I mean, my <laughs> my parents were very uh, free range parents in a lot of ways. They mm -hmm. I was also the fourth kid. You know, my sister is twelve years older than me, then nine, and then three. And so at that point, they're just kind of like <laughs> clearly kids know what they're doing. Just let just you know go do your own thing. Mm -hmm. um, so you know. For me, it was less grown, less the family environment. I mean, we all love each other. We have a very good family and uh, very supportive of each other. Um, and my dad, I mean, I grew up, my friends make fun of me because I don't listen to music hardly ever. Interesting. Um, and they say that they, the running joke is that I don't like music, which is not exactly true, but I just prefer spoken word, like, talk radio or podcast or comedy albums, stuff like that, mm -hmm. to music. Um, and I think that's because my dad would listen to the podcasts of the day in the 90s were cassette tapes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if YouTube kids know what cassette tapes are, but um, <laughs> they're what your dad's super old Land Cruiser, that little, you know, four-inch slot right. right below the CD player. And it would just be, you know, cassette tape after cassette tape after cassette tape of doctors talking at seminars mm -hmm. about whatever topic. And so that could be, no matter how boring it was, I still, that's what I was, just had to listen to. That was mm -hmm. his job, he, when, so I had to listen to it too. Um, was so, that kind of maybe what started to pique your interest? Or when you were a kid, was it just kind of like, oh, this annoying thing my dad listens to? Well, I mean, I don't know that it was necessarily ever annoying. I think it was, and he would sometimes like ask me what I thought about it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know what to say, I didn't know, but he's still engaging me a little bit. Right. What really got me interested in it was I was, if he were, if I said, hey dad, can you take me to the mall? He would say, sure, but I need to swing by the pharmacy first. 
Okay. Well, it, it, it'll only take five minutes, I promise. <laughs> Four hours later, I'm still in the pharmacy. You know, at that point, we don't have cell phones. The internet is just a, a brand new thing, and it's not everywhere. So I'm looking at labels of different stuff, just flipping through books, talking to the different practitioners. I mean, you know, screwing around, just doing whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I was immersed in it. And they were, in a lot of ways, sort of uh, my babysitters. Like the pharmacy as a whole. It was like my daycare right. in a lot of ways. Um, and so I, you know, it was... I got the opportunity to speak to all of these really cool practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, it, the, the value in that has been tremendous. Right. You know, I can, I've heard, I can, I have heard of a lot of different things growing up and been exposed to a lot of different ideas, for mm -hmm. sure. Absolutely. So maybe that can kind of dovetail into uh how did you stumble on the carnivore diet? <laughs> Can you maybe, I guess, walk us through the steps of, of yeah. how you arrived there and why you decided uh, to do kind of an extreme diet compared to, you know, uh, what most people are eating? It's only kind of extreme. It's <laughs> definitely extreme. Well, there's uh, a lot of extreme diets out there now. Yes. So. No, absolutely. And I would, I would definitely consider it an extreme diet. Uh, you know, you're comparing it to the standard American diet. So, of course, it's going to be extreme. Um, but I, that happened when I was, so I guess the beginning of the story is I was 15, 14, 15, and I was pretty overweight, um, really lazy, played a lot of video games. You know, the home environment, like I said, was not, you know, my, we still ordered pizza, mm -hmm. you know, pretty regular American family in that way. Uh, you know, got lectures from our dad regard you know even though he was the one ordering it it was still lecture us on why we shouldn't eat it um so you know a sedentary lifestyle plus bad diet equals you know weight gain and mm -hmm. unhealthy low energy all sorts of stuff and so my 15th birthday i got sort of fed up with that and asked my dad for a personal trainer for my birthday so he bought me i don't know maybe 10 sessions with a personal trainer and I immediately jumped on the low-fat train, mm -hmm. and I think you probably know that's not great for yourself. It's not like a really good way of going about health and wellness. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I did lose a lot of weight really fast, but it was sort of depressing though. I mean, it was uh, mentally, I was not very healthy. Mm. Um, I was very... Uh, Looking back on it, probably would be considered anorexic mm. for that short period of time, you know, or some sort of body dysmorphia, you know? Yeah. Like, I could look in the mirror and think, that's a fat kid, but I'm very thin mm. at the time. And so, you know, I, I, I don't know. It was, I, I would f sometimes find myself eating an entire loaf of bread because I was just so hungry. Yeah. Like, I was starving myself that much. Um, so that was sort of my, the beginning of my journey with diet and I promise we'll get to carnivore. <laughs> um, and you know, I, I sort of got out of the, it took some time, some healing and it wasn't necessarily professional help or anything like that. Um, I moved to Japan and high school as an exchange student. And so I was eating whatever my host mom made, mm -hmm. which was great because she did homemade meals all the time and I helped her cook. And so I learned to cook there. Um, and, you know, put on weight and got more healthy and had a more healthy approach to food. Mm -hmm. And so having that baseline experience of an unhealthy experience, an unhealthy relationship, I kind of, like, I, I've, I've, it's like I've been there, done that, and I don't mm. ever want to go back. Yeah. Um, and so I think around 2003, 2004, I've learned about the paleo diet. And read a little bit, a little bit about it, and it seemed to make a lot of sense. And so I started doing that. And I mean, I would tell, like, I, I remember telling my girlfriend at the time, you know, about this paleo diet, and she's thinking I'm some sort of crazy person. <laughs> and you know, so uh, I did that. So I guess for 15 years, I was mostly paleo. Okay. I mean, don't get me wrong. I partied hard in my 20s. Um, <laughs> Plenty of alcohol, plenty of, you know, uh, chips and salsa with friends. 
But still, again, I don't want to have that unhealthy relationship with food to the point where, you know, oh, I can't label myself paleo because I had some chips and salsa. Mm-hmm. You know, that doesn't, that's, that's an unhealthy approach. Yeah. Um, and so then in 2000, January 2018, a little bit before that, do you know Dr. Sean Baker by chance? No. So he's the big carnivore proponent. And he did an episode of um, a small podcast called the Joe Rogan Podcast. Oh, but, yeah. You know, no big. <laughs> no. Yeah. It's very, very – He's he might have grown a little bit since then, but very small. Um, and his approach was sort of very similar. He didn't have an unhealthy relationship with food. And, you know, I look at other people that are promoting diets, mm-hmm. and they're – militaristic about it sometimes, very dogmatic and very, you know, you're either doing this or you're doing it wrong Mm. or you're a bad person sometimes. I mean, when it comes to, you know, there are, I, you know, I don't don't want to poke the bear, but to be quite frank, there are a lot of vegans that will be, that get very upset at just anybody eating meat because they think that you're, they, they think that ethically you're being, hmm. you're harming animals. Right. And so uh, his approach was, look, try it. If you feel good, great. If you don't, stop. Like it's not, I'm not here to w- mm-hmm. hold your hand through it. So I started that. I did, I just planned on doing January of 2018. I'll just try it for a month, see what happens. What can, what could possibly go wrong? And I just never stopped. So what, uh, aside from a a general answer like animal products, (laughs) what's in the carnivore diet? What are the things that you're eating on a day-to-day basis? Uh, For me personally, I mean, the farthest I will steer, as far as food product goes, the farthest I'll steer away from, like, animal products would be, like, maybe some wild blueberries. You can buy like a big frozen bag of wild blueberries, mm-hmm. and I'll maybe if I have yogurt, I'll put some frozen blueberries in my yogurt sometimes. Okay. Um, and that's I'm trying to think if I eat other stuff like that, and it's not. It just doesn't really happen. And I again, I'm not. If I wanted it, I would eat it. Right. You know, I had. So I, I mean, I have two kids and a wife, and they're not carnivores, much to my chagrin, <laughs> and. <laughs> They, I, so I bought like a the a little canister of raw cashews for them, and you know, so I had three or four of them yesterday. I don't think anybody's going to. I I don't feel bad about it. I don't think that you think I'm a liar. You know, it's it's like a, <laughs> it's like you know you a lot of other diets. If you break it like that, like you're almost exiled from the community. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, day to day, just lots and lots of ground beef, steaks if I'm feeling fancy, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, I feel great. I really do. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, before we started rolling here, you had mentioned that you're eating about 99% animal products. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about why they recommend removing vegetables from the diet? Well, um yeah, I think that it's – there's a few reasons. Um, so, you know, specifically vegetables, any sort of – you know, the, the point of biology, the point of life is to, you know, pass on your biology. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the point of having kids is to pass on your biology to them, and then they do it, and then they do it, and they do it. Plants are no different. They want to proliferate and have – you know, as many plant kin as they can possibly. <laughs> Little know. plant children. Right. Or however you want to think about it. But yeah, but they, you know, so, but they don't have hands and legs and teeth and, you know, brains to defend themselves. Mm-hmm. So they've, they, there are, they have created natural um, uh, toxins to sort of protect themselves. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they – so when a plant – when an animal eats it, it's supposed to be – it doesn't taste good. It gets a very bitter taste, and they'll spit it out, and they won't eat it, and they won't eat that plant again. Um, the 
fruit is a little bit different. The fruit is meant to be sweet and meant to entice animals to eat it because that's where the seeds are. Mm -hmm. And so they eat it and then they go and they defecate the seeds somewhere else. Um, but, you know, so it's not that it can't, it's not that I, if I ate a, ate a carrot, I would have a stomach ache. And you also have to think that carrots today are not what carrots were mm. even 100 years ago. Right. You know, they we have bred them to be a specific way. And before agriculture or even modern agriculture uh, and transportation worldwide, you know, I, you can't get grapes from Chile in, in Scandinavia mm -hmm. 200 years ago. You know, that just wasn't – you just ate – if there was veg, fruits and vegetables that were in season around you, that's what you would eat. Right. So the argument would be that the majority of your ancestors' calories likely came from animal products. Mm -hmm. um, and by animal products, I mean meat of any sort. Right. Um, but then there's, you know, grains and sugars in general that people, that, you know, I, th I think – you look more at the paleo diet and that's they're eliminating those and then this is just taking it one step further right and saying all plants right so so largely there's um i mean you definitely touch on something really important which is that the um the way that we have uh, i guess industrialized agriculture yeah is completely changed the foods and whether yeah. we can take the far extreme of something like genetic modification where they're actually taking the genetic material out of another species and putting it into a plant. Yeah. Um, and even just selective breeding, where maybe they've tried to get the carrots bigger or whatever, yeah. all these different things. Largely, the process has changed the, the, the way that those foods would be digested in our body yeah. and the different nutrients that they're going to contain. Yeah. And you also have to think about the way that the, that the modern, agric modern agriculture will you know, how it operates is that you have these large monocrop fields and they're taking the same nutrients out of the soil every single harvest. Mm. And they're actually breaking down the biodiversity of that uh, area of land. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you take away grassland and grass, the roots, if you look at them, they're, they go very deep. And there's a lot of... Um, bacteria and bugs and other animals that forage and go through and even like you know you add like a you know small moths or areas of trees and stuff like that where they're going to have other animals you have a very biodiverse mm. environment that all feeds off each other you wipe that out and then you monocrop and you just limit the um the ability of the soil to support any sort of life given enough time mm -hmm. i mean you know there are that is not to say that you, there are ways, I mean, there are ways around that. You can do field, crop rotation and stuff like that. Um, I'm not a agriculture expert by any, by any stretch. So beyond that, I don't know, but I, I do understand that there are other ways to, you know, make that, to circumvent that problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that in this day and age, there's a lot of um, I guess permaculture and people that are approaching uh the idea of growing your food and trying to not deplete the soils yeah. and trying to keep it a little bit more true to what had, uh, to what would have been um, natural a couple hundred years ago or yeah. thousands of years ago. Yeah. Um, and then you also kind of touched on that idea of like eating locally, eating the foods that are grown near where you are, mm -hmm. um, because from the you know standpoint of trying to eat. Um, Similar to our ancestors, uh, you're totally right. Up until just the last, you know, maybe 100 years or so, nobody would have been eating foods that came from thousands of miles away, yeah. much less across an ocean away. Yeah. Um, but that really is the norm now. If you walk into the grocery store, you're going to see, like, all of the tropical fruits, all of the root vegetables, all of the other yeah. vegetables, whether they're in season or not. Yeah. Um, they're in season somewhere. And yeah. And they're bringing that season to, the, to us. And, I mean, you probably wouldn't even had fruits and vegetables from – I mean, unless you lived in some place like New York City or something where it's a – really big hub, you probably wouldn't have much from even more than 100 miles away. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, that might even be extreme back then. Right. And they tasted different. They Like a carrot was hard and tasted like a root. It was very difficult. And 
you'd have to cook for you cook it in very special ways and it's not i mean it's it's everything eggplants carrots grapes tomatoes all these things were way different than what Mm -hmm. we experience today interesting and you know that being said they have probably bred out a lot of the you know so it's toxin so to speak Mm -hmm. so i mean they're probably more digestible less harmful Mm. um than what they used to be so you know i think the the best way for me how i look at it is there's a cost benefit analysis and certainly plants can be medicine and certainly they can be you know if i was starving i would definitely eat them and i wouldn't bat an eye Mm -hmm. um but if i have a choice I'm always going to choose a steak or some ground beef or, you know, I don't know, some like a pork sausage. Right. You know, and it has all of the nutrients that my body needs in like the exact ratios. And if the animal is eating what its natural diet should be, so like a grass-fed cow, Mm -hmm. they're going to have their meat's going to be, have all the nutrients that, Mm -hmm. that, that you would typically need. Do you eat lots of organ meats? God. (laughs) Because <laughs> I've because I've heard that like you eat the organ meats yeah. so that you can then get a lot more of those like I guess secondhand vegetables so to speak sure. that the animal is eating. Yeah, I, I wish I wish I I wish I could say yes. And part of it would be cool factor. Like it sounds like a I feel like it would make me more manly if I was eating like a liver or like a heart or something. I don't know. Um, but it just tastes so bad, and I don't. Maybe that's a sign that you, that I don't need it, mm. or that I'm genetically predisposed to not need it. To like maybe it's if liver tastes as bad as it does, then maybe you shouldn't. I don't know. Yeah. Now, if I could find a way to make it to where I enjoyed it, I would probably eat it. Probably, of course, if I enjoy it, then I'll eat it. But yeah, <laughs> um, you know, I've tried. They make. Um, What's it called? The, like the butcher's blend, some people will call it. And it varies from butcher to butcher, but it'll be, you know, like one is 50% ground beef, 10% kidney, 20% heart, 20% liver. Mm. Have you ever had um, any sort of organ meat like that? It's not, it's not palate. I mean, people say they like it and more power to them. I just think it tastes awful. Yeah. In that, you know. Caveat, there's lots of great nutrients in it. Mm -hmm. Tons of vitamin A, lots of fat-soluble vitamins. You probably get more lysine and more like um, uh, like different uh, amino acids that would probably help with a lot of different, you know, health um, outcomes. But Mm -hmm. if you you got (laughs) to, I don't know. I've thought about taking the liver, freezing it. And then while it's frozen, slicing it into like little tiny cubes and refreezing it and then just taking mm. like pills. Yeah. You, I mean, you say it like it's easy, but it's not. <laughs> I mean, taking it as a pill definitely sounds preferable just to me little. than actually eating the liver. Um, but I've heard, you know, we've even had a few guests on the podcast that have, you know, spoken a lot about benefits of organ meats. Did they tell, um, did, did they lie to you and say they ate them? You know, um, <laughs> there was there was one woman on the podcast. Um, I can't remember the name of the product, but it was some kind of like powdered collagen yeah. thing that she recommended as an alternative if you don't want to eat the organ meats. Sure, and um, I, I mean I call them why I, they very well. There are plenty of people to eat it, and they I don't know how they do it. I wish they would come to my house and make it for me for mm-hmm. sure. And that's you know there was one time we had a guy that used to work at the pharmacies. His name was Paul. And I think he's in the Northwest now in Portland somewhere, but he was a real eccentric guy, like super cool, really knowledgeable, like could care less what you thought about him and his, and his diet. Mm-hmm. And he would make these raw liver smoothies and it would be, you know, we, we so at the pharmacies we have uh, Betsy Ross local grass fed beef. And so he would order the liver and he would slice it up frozen. He'd put it in a blender with a little bit of water, a little bit of garlic, and he would blend it up. And maybe I think a little bit of onion, and he would just chug it. And I, I tried it a couple of times, and there's a big gag reflex, but it, it's still that same idea of popping it like pills, like mm. you're you just get it done with, you yeah. know. And you know, I don't know, it's 
yes, it wasn't great enough for me to keep doing. I don't know. Yeah, and you know, I've not seen the liver smoothie on y'all's menu, so I don't. It looks like that didn't stick. <laughs> well, depending on how this podcast goes, maybe we'll have that soon. <laughs> Maybe we'll get a, a influx of emails. Yeah. Um, how interesting. Um, so then to think about like what one of your meals looks like. So you're not eating vegetables right. with it or anything. So you just like eat a steak and that's your meal. Uh, yeah. If I was if I was not very hungry, I would eat a, a steak. A steak. Yeah. And if um, you were, you might eat like two steaks, three steaks. Yeah. A typical a typical meal would be if I was eating steak, it would probably be two steaks. Um, but you know, steaks are expensive. And, you know, I don't know, I'm not made of money. So I usually go with just ground beef. Mm-hmm. Um, I try to get, um, you know, and grass-fed beef, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very supportive of the idea and everything. But it, it, there's a certain flavor to it where, I mean, I eat so much meat that it just is, I don't know. It, I usually will just get the Whole Foods um, – pasture raised mm. you know it's still it's probably better than what you would get at another grocery store right. but it's not like the top tier like yeah. you know the cows were i don't know that's not wagyu yeah They're not massaged um yeah. <laughs> so you know i would uh probably eat like mm, i don't know if i'm really hungry maybe two pounds in one sitting uh twice a day but the total amount rarely goes over three pounds in okay. one day. I have to be really hungry to do that. So would you say you're also on a like ketogenic diet then? It's or definitely you're in ketosis, yeah, presumably, right? For sure, at least somewhat. At least sometimes, I would think. Um, I don't test it because mm-hmm. I don't really care that much because it's just not what I'm. That's not my goal. Right. Um, it would be interesting to know for sure for conversations like this and people that want to do keto or that, you know, people that could really benefit from a lot of the side effects of keto. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the, the, a diet with that, with such a high protein amount, mm-hmm. you get into, uh, I think it's called gluconeogenesis, you know, turning protein into glucose. Mm-hmm. That, you know, you get this massive, you know, 200 grams or whatever in a sitting, you're going to turn some of that into glucose because your body needs glucose, but it can produce its own to where I would get knocked out of ketosis. But then, you know, think about if you sat down and ate four burgers, you know, nothing else, just the meat, Mm -hmm. maybe some cheese. I don't know. Do you think you'd be hungry for a while or no? Probably not. (laughs) Right. It's, it's, I mean, it's really amazing what it does for for satiety is that it's, is that the right word? Satiety? Mm-hmm. I don't actually know how you pronounce that word, but um, <laughs> Satiety, yeah. But Anyhow. being satiated by your meal. <laughs> yes. A nice workaround. Um, to where I don't eat until, I don't eat food until 12 or 1. Mm-hmm. And then again, probably till at the earliest 6 o'clock, but usually closer to 8 or 9. So there's these big gaps where I'm not eating any food. Right. And so my body's having to make ketones for energy. And I don't think about food unless I'm hungry. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. When I first started this, I would get, I would forget to eat. And then I would get so, and I, like I lost a ton of fat and gained a lot of muscle really mm-hmm. quickly. And it was not, which was a great side effect. It's not why I did it, but it was, I mean, who's going to complain about that? Yeah. <laughs> um, to where I guess my metabolism was ramped up so much that I, I wasn't just, I just wasn't used to the timing of it and Mm -hmm. like the signals my body was sending me. And I would get, all of a sudden I would get so hungry, I would feel ill. Mm. Like I'm going to throw up, but I didn't have anything to throw up. And it like, I would have to eat something just very slowly. And all of a sudden I would feel better. Right. It was very strange. Anyhow. But yeah, it's definitely an interesting um, kind of phenomenon, how our body's constantly like regulating the blood sugar, regulating yeah. our hunger and trying to keep us in that sweet spot between, yeah. you know, cause too much blood sugar is very, very bad. Yeah. Too low blood sugar is very, very bad. Yeah. So the body works really hard to try and like maintain that kind of perfect balance. Yeah. Um, I would so- argue that maybe even any, any excess glucose is probably a bad thing. And so why give your body excess glucose? If your body can make exactly what it needs, mm. then that should be the ideal that we strive for. You know, 
That if you go to a wedding and you have a glass of wine or four, I don't know, I might. Yeah, no big deal. Of course, you're having a good time, and like there's a social aspect to it, and you know there's a lot of health and wellness in that community and having fun and letting go. Mm-hmm. But in your daily life, I think it's really important to, you know, keep that stuff in mind. If you can put your body at the ideal, that's where you should be. Mm-hmm. So. so it's kind of been, uh, I guess, intermittent fasting, but it was kind of uh, an effect rather than something that you were like going at it like, okay, I'm going to do intermittent fasting. Yeah. I'm going to try and extend the time between my meals. This was more like as you were shifting your diet, it kind of naturally turned into this intermittent fasting. It's more, I think, more accurately described as inadvertent fasting. Inadvertent fasting. Yeah. <laughs> inadvertent so, intermittent fasting. Yeah. Um, um, some people call it uh, intermittent feasting, and I, I like the inadvertent fasting a lot better because it's not – my goal is not to eat as much as possible. My goal is to eat until I'm full, until I'm satiated, mm-hmm. and then I'm done. And sometimes – that means that, you know, I put I make four hamburgers and I eat three and a half and that last half one I just look at it, I'm like, I'm not eh, I'm just not hungry. Mm-hmm. And then it just doesn't get eaten. Right. And that doesn't happen very often. There's very little waste. But you know, when I again you know, going back to just starting this diet and like learning the ins and outs of how my body's responding to it, mm-hmm. I tried to eat as much as I possibly could. Like I would try to I you know, really push my limit mm-hmm. a couple times. And you're, it's really interesting how your body will stop you from eating when it's satiated. Yeah. It's a very strong feeling. And, I mean, I I almost, like, I would, it, it would, like, a gag reflex almost. Like, yeah. Like, get it out of your mouth. You're, we're full. Leave us alone. Yeah. So. And it's interesting that when you do, um, I don't know, I guess kind of get into um, a more natural way of eating, Um, Because even outside of saying like, oh, this is extreme and he's only eating meat or whatever, like it's also important to recognize that you've eliminated processed foods. You've eliminated processed sugar. There's all of these different things that we now know are are tremendously harmful, the processed uh, wheat and white bread and all of this stuff. Um, So getting your body away from those processed foods, the weird food chemicals, the weird food additives, the MSG, you start to really um, kind of rebuild that communication with your body almost, Mm -hmm. where you do become very aware of when you're satiated and you don't want to eat anymore. Yeah. Like a lot of the people out there who are still eating those processed foods, those foods are kind of designed to trick you into overeating and to kind of trick your brain into not realizing that it's already had, you know, more calories than it needs. Yeah. Um, So for people that are still kind of eating that way, I think it's hard to imagine being able to trust your instincts. Yeah. You know, because if you're eating those foods, your dietary instincts are just telling you to always eat more, always eat more than you need. Yeah. Snacking all the time. Well, I mean, yeah, you, and, um, you know, you're, it's like your instincts go away in the, with the standard American diet because you have these, you know, insulin spikes and crashes, which, mm-hmm. you know, also correlate with cortisol and stress. And, you know, your your signals are totally out of whack. Right. Like it's, you know, instinct would be the wrong word. Like you no longer have that instinct. Mm-hmm. Um, it's completely gone. The, the chemicals that you're putting in your mouth – and into your body are sending signals to for more and more and more. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even if you're – so, you know, you could have like a, you know, a donut, like the probably the worst food on earth, you know, fried sugar bread, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in vegetable oil. Like it's the worst. Um, there's also zero nutrients in it. There's macronutrients. There's, you know, protein or whatever, very little protein if any. But there's carbohydrates and fat. But there's – What's the vitamin A? What's the vitamin D? What's the vitamin C and E and you know B B vitamins? All it's, they're they're missing, mm-hmm. and so you're all you're also feeding without nourishing, and so there's also going to be signals for that that you know your body knows that's where you you get your nutrients from, mm-hmm. except for vitamin D. Vitamin D comes from the sun, but you know what I mean. The so you're getting you're turning off your satiation. Satiation. I should just stop using the word. <laughs> Um, you stop, you turn off that signal, but then you turn on the signal for micronutrients. Mm -hmm. And so it's like your body, it's a very confusing 
mentally. Right. Like how does how does one even approach that that problem, except for more food? Mm-hmm. You know. And I think that's kind of the trap that's been created in a lot of ways. Yeah. Because for the, you know, powers that be that are creating all of these horrible foods, like all they want is for us to eat more. And they really could care less if we're like getting sick or we're overweight or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah, that that helps the, yes, that I agree. That seems to be the case. Yeah. You know, so in whatever shape or form that people are able to move away from that modern diet, whether it's through paleo, keto, veganism, carnivore, or whatever. Um, I think there's starting to be this element of agreement among all of these different kind of widely different diets, um, but agreement around like, hey, there's these certain things that we can all agree we should avoid and stop eating. Yeah, Um, I think that's right. I think for sure. And I mean, carnivores get a lot of flack from vegans, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm not going to speak for all vegans or all carnivores or anything like that. I, com- I I applaud vegans who get off the standard American diet. Good for you. I think you're taking a step in the right direction. Mm-hmm. And if veganism is working great for you, then I think that you should keep doing it. I'm not going to stop you. But, you know, it, you're you're right in that there's you know, the, you know, if it, it seems like just stepping away from that modern diet in any direction is a progress. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, for a lot of people out there that, um, you know, most of us are getting to a point where maybe we're fed up with where we're at. We're just looking for different solutions. And it can feel really overwhelming that there's all of these, like, different things. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And it starts to look like, oh, well, what do I eat? This person says that thing's good and this person says that thing is bad. Yeah. Um, So I think you touched on a really important point, which is just seeing what works for you. Yeah. And, like, listening to your body enough that you're able to tell when you're eating in a certain way that's making you feel your most vital and most healthful. Yeah. Um, And not just trying to consume strict yourself inside of like this person's way of eating or that person's way of eating. Um, Largely in this day and age where people are, uh, you know, we're more connected through social media and YouTube and all of this. Like I get a lot of people in my health coaching that are like, oh, well, you know, I found this person on YouTube. And so I started doing their diet and like, I just can't figure out why, like, why don't I look like her now? Yeah. Um, I found this gamer girl on Twitch, and she told me about her diet, and now I do that diet. And, exactly. And, yeah. like, why am I not a better gamer now? I bought her bath water, and why am I not thin and beautiful? <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting position that we're in as consumers now because there's a lot of different information out there. Yeah. And it can feel really overwhelming to know which way to go. Absolutely. Um, but uh, but I think it's always really cool to hear people talk about, like, how they came to their diet and why they chose this way of eating and, and just kind of illustrating for people that, you know, there's not just one best way of eating that's going to work for everyone. Yeah. Just kind of letting them see that, hey, there's all of these different options and you can just kind of try the different things that resonate with you and then see what makes you feel your best. Yeah, and don't get married to it. You know, it's not it's not a, a sacred covenant between two loving. I mean, it's fine to break up break up with your diet if it's not working <laughs> with you. You know, I was telling you before the show. I mean, I I tried vegetarian a vegetarian diet because my girlfriend at the time was a vegetarian, and I you know whatever I was a, a young man tr- trying to make my girlfriend happy and doing dumb things like that, thinking that's going to make her happy. Not that vegetarianism is dumb, but doing it for a girlfriend is dumb. Um, do it for yourself. Right. And I didn't feel good. It was, didn't feel normal. I didn't like, you know, it's not like I was depressed or something like that from it. But it just didn't, I don't know, it just didn't feel right. And so mm-hmm. I just stopped. And not a big deal. Right. And, uh, you know, one thing that I've, you know, growing up, having the background that I have and having the experience, the life experience that I have, friends and acquaintances and strangers will often ask me, you know, so what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what do you think of this? And, you know, it's, it's almost uncomfortable because, you know, I get over that, but it's almost uncomfortable because I, I, you know, it took what works for me works for me based on trial and error from what Mm. I've done. And, 
that I'm happy to share my experience with you and tell you what works for me and why I think it does. But don't do it because I do it. Do it because it works for you. Mm-hmm. You know, and you know, ho- hopefully people listening to this, uh, you know, if you if they think that carnivore way of eating is something that can work for them, great. Try it. But if it's not working for you, stop. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you don't tell your friends, well, Brad told me to keep doing it. <laughs> I don't. Just stop. Right. I don't know. Um, so you have your own podcast as well, Cultivate Wellness. The Cultivate Wellness Podcast, yes. Awesome. Um, have you ventured into this topic on your own podcast? In the carnivore diet? Yeah, uh, a couple times. I mean, so the podcast is brought to you by People's Rx, Austin's favorite pharmacy. Um, so the I've interviewed Dr. Sean Baker, who is the... Um, sort of like the main, the most visible figure mm-hmm. in the carnivore movement, so to speak. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. It feels weird even calling it a movement, you know. It feels very cultish. But, <laughs> um, I mean, I've interviewed him, uh, Dr. Stephen Hussey as well. Uh, he's, he, I think he's more akin to my sort of approach. Like, Dr. Baker only eats ribeyes. Uh, maybe not only he, he sometimes eats other stuff if he's on the road or something like that but if he's, if he's at home and he's in 100 percent control of his diet it's ribeyes all the time i don't know where he gets the money for it he's a doctor so that's probably you know. <laughs> but that's uh but so dr stephen hussey is more similar to me and that you know i think he's up in the upper 90s I, I, i'm not going to speak too much for him but mm-hmm. that's my understanding so um and he actually you know there there's has a lot of great information on the uh, glucose and heart health, inflammation, um, all sorts of stuff. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, the majority of people that I – I would love to have a vegan on the podcast, not to break them apart, but just to learn more about their – you know, spread their message. Mm-hmm. You know, it's going to help somebody. Um, I just haven't really found anybody. And that's uh, that's okay. Uh, maybe someone will yeah. reach out to me. Um but the majority of people that I speak to are, um, when it comes to diet, are usually keto, as you can imagine mm-hmm. with keto's popularity. Yeah, keto's very popular right now. Yeah, they're like the coolest kid in school. Yeah, <laughs> the coolest, the coolest diet on the books. Yeah, definitely going to get king and queen right. at prom this year for right. sure. So you know, you had kind of spoken earlier about. Um, you know, when the body is just taking in protein, it will create as much glucose as it needs. Um, yeah, I think that I don't necessarily know that it's specific that it's only from protein, but protein and fats. So if you're not taking in the if you're not taking in carbohydrates uh, that would turn into glucose, your body will make glucose from mm-hmm. it, whatever sources it can. Right. So do you feel like your energy levels are? I mean, I would assume you've been eating this way for about a year and a half now. Yeah. Carnivore diet. Um, I would assume that it, your energy levels are awesome, right? So I wouldn't do it if they weren't, <laughs> for sure. It would be, um, you know, it's it's interesting. The I feel like I don't need to do as much. Um, like when you're thinking of like exercise and lifting weights, playing soccer, um, swimming, you know, all the different things that I do, I can get away with doing less mm. on this diet. So. Um, you know, I don't know if that's a function of less blood glucose or, um, or what, I mean, it, you know, it, it's definitely, I'm getting more protein so that, that it's probably as simple as that. I would think that I'm just getting enough, I'm getting more protein. And so I'm seeing results with less, with less work. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, I think that's a pretty common result is people will do shorter workouts, um, and see better results. Interesting. Yeah. So. Do you do, uh, like protein powders or anything like that? Or are you like just eating the actual foods, actual animal products? I mean, I wouldn't be against doing a protein powder. Um, I'll do very rarely like a collagen protein powder, but not like a whey. I don't know why. I just don't have any at my house. And there's usually other stuff inside of, in a whey protein, collagen Protein powder is just collagen. Mm-hmm. And so, and I'm getting, 
theoretically I would be getting a lot, you know, a lot of stuff in that collagen protein powder that I wouldn't be getting from just uh, muscle meat. Mm -hmm. So if I'm not cooking bones with marrow and eating a lot of liver, then I'm not going to get those connect a lot of connective tissues and lysine and stuff like that that would be found in those things. So like a collagen would mm -hmm. be good. And you know, I, I I still get injured sometimes. You know, I still get sick sometimes. It's not a panacea. So if I was feeling sick, I wouldn't be. You know, I, I'll still take a vitamin C. Mm -hmm. You know, that's from acerola cherry or whatever it's called, and. I don't think that's a bad thing. Right. You know, vitamin C is going to help. Mm -hmm. So might as well take it. And then um, you said you're mostly eating beef, right? Oh, yeah, for Do sure. you think that there's an element of trying to, like, incorporate a, di a diverse amount of animals or that's okay to just kind of be, like, you know, primarily one an type of animal that you're eating? Uh, well, so the argument against eating other ones is – um, we try to focus on ruminants because I, th I think the the fat profile is going to be a little bit better on a ruminant animal, some of the, like an animal that's eating the grass, and then there's several different stomachs that digest that and turn it into like a, a good ratio of six and threes and nines and all that sort of stuff. Talking mm -hmm. about omegas, um, the I mean I love pigs, um, not. Not necessarily. As, I would like a pig pet, but I'm talking about you know like the way they taste is fantastic. Everyone loves bacon, and so in sausage and pork chops, chicken is fine. It's not as filling. Mm. There's not like a there's not that sense. There's not the satiety. Yeah, that word again. Uh, when it comes to chicken, like I'd probably have to eat a whole chicken, um, and it would still just not feel like it was enough. Um, Part of that is that's not as nutrient dense, mm -hmm. um, and you. So when pigs and chickens eat a high omega six diet, which they're inevitably, inevitably going to do because of the feed that they're given, is just a bunch of you know a lot of the same crap that we eat. And so they don't, for some reason, I don't know the the mechanism necessarily, but for some reason that doesn't process the same so you actually get that high vitamin a high, a high omega-6 in their meat when you eat it mm. and that can cause some free radical issues within your in your body interesting yeah so you know it's um the work of uh tucker goodrich i think um would be a good sort of jumping off point to figure out more about that. Right. For sure. So like if I eat eggs, I, I try my best to find chickens that are out there eating as many bugs as possible and as little feed as possible. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I don't know how good I'm doing at that. I don't know how successful I am, but I try. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll see, you know, like the pasture raised yeah. eggs um, pretty commonly now. Most of the grocery stores, I'll see something like that. I mean, they're everywhere. Yeah. Which is, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, it was not, I remember a time when, like, we had pasture-raised eggs in the pharmacy because we have, like, a little grocery section with, mm -hmm. like, in grass-fed beef and stuff like that. And, like, we were, like, one of the only places that you could get it. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, uh, it's, I probably shouldn't name drop, like, local references, but, like, H-E-B. So, like, you're, you know, I don't know. Tom Thumb or uh, what's other like big national chains? I don't know. Safeway? Does Safeway? that even exist anymore? I sure, Kroger, Safeway, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, you know, you can find. You know, I don't know the quality between their pasture raised eggs versus Vital Farms pasture raised eggs. Is Vital Farms better? Maybe. I mean, I want to say yes. I've actually been out to the farm, uh, the Vital Farms farm, and it's pretty amazing. You're just watching the chickens yeah. run around in the grass, and they have, like, this big, beautiful, like, kind of forest they get to go hang out in. I'm yeah. like, I want to be a – well, maybe I don't want to be a chicken on your farm, but it's just an egg farm. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, but I think there's a lot to be said about animals that are um, – Raised in their natural habitat, eating their natural diet. Um, yeah. And like you alluded to earlier, there's a lot of research now kind of showing us, hey, here's how vastly different the nutritional profile is going to be yeah. depending on what those animals are eating. Yeah, um, for sure. 
And, you know, it's, it's the farms like Vital Farms that are providing actually a really great life for those chickens, where in the wild they would be, I mean, the food, the food is not as, as readily available, um, and they're at extreme risk of, you know, a, a, some sort of predator. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the end, these chickens are getting eaten one way or the other, but still. Um, and, I, I mean, it's just an argument, you know, the, the, that a plant-based person would make is that you're, you know, harming these animals. And I, I think there's a, a very good argument to be said that that's not really the case, that in a wild setting, these animals would be, have a much worse life. And be much shorter. Mm. But I don't know. That's a really good point. Um, And, you know, I think that there's an extent to, uh, you know, there's only so much that we even really know necessarily. Like by the time we're in the grocery store purchasing uh, purchasing an animal product or purchasing a steak or something like that. Yeah. There's only so much we can know about how that animal was raised and, you know... um, To the extent that, you know, how much do we know about the animal's life cycle in the wild and how is their life, as you said, when there's like constant predators and like you never know. Um, For a lot of those animals in the wild, like every single day could be their last day. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, a a chicken would have, uh, you know, other like hawks would be a predator, foxes, wild, other wild dogs. I mean, snakes. Mm-hmm. There would be tons of stuff that would be where, you know, on a farm, they have a farmer that, you know, that's their livelihood. They're going to do everything they can to protect it, mm-hmm. you know. And to provide that good, healthful life yeah. to the animal. And, I mean, people want to buy. Uh, they want uh, – there's a – even if the nutrition profile is the exact same, I would bet that people are paying – would be happily pay a premium – for an animal that they're told lived a better life. Yeah. You know, I probably would. I'll, I would. Pay, an, I'll pay an extra <laughs> dollar per dozen of eggs to know that those chickens had a better life. Sure. Mm-hmm. Why not? Interesting. What about um, seafood? Do you eat seafood? Uh, sometimes, yeah. I ate like a, a pound of salmon the other day um, just because it's on sale. But, um, yeah, it's not something that I like make a point of doing just because mm-hmm. it is really expensive yeah but my son really likes smoked salmon so we have smoked salmon often in the house so i'll mm-hmm. take a little bit of that um i will take some i also my i use cod liver oil i make my other son's formula from scratch and i put cod liver oil in it so sometimes i'll just take a swig of that but i mean it's it's cost prohibitive for me right. i mean it's not that Even if, you know, it's not necessarily about can I afford it or can I not afford it. It's do I want to afford it, Mm. you know, and the answer is no. Yeah. I mean, beef is doing great for me. Right. So I'm going to stick to it. So you'd mentioned um, before we filmed that you also uh, are very interested in kids' health. Yeah, Um, of course. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. And maybe do you think that a carnivore diet is suitable for children or? Uh. So, you know, man, is it suitable for for children? For um, I would probably I I would my guess would be yes, it would be fine. Um, but you're also dealing with uh, kids. I mean, kids are kids are humans too. They have their own wants and desires, and you know they're their own little people and Mm -hmm. they have you know it's it would be wrong to force them onto something that they are not into now that's not to say that you should just let them have a birthday cake every day um though you know that tends to happen i you know i don't understand why it really confuses me how people health conscious parents around everywhere are still giving their kids, like, still buying cookies for their kids and giving them their kids cookies. Like, they, and they fell for that trap when they were kids. Mm -hmm. So why are they doing it to their kids? Like, why not stop the cycle? Anyhow, the, the, (laughs) the reason why I'm more passionate about children's health is because they don't have a choice. They don't Mm -hmm. have a voice. You know, I can tell you what you, uh, what I think that you should do, and, 
you know, you're set in your ways. You have your own source of income. You have your own choice. You can drive to the store at any time. You can change your diet. Mm -hmm. A kid cannot. Um, And it's really difficult for adults to change their patterns, it seems. But kids don't have that barrier. They can get past that. Like you can really make a huge difference in that person in the the rest of their life for the next 90 years or whatever. Who knows? Maybe forever by the time they're adults. But um, I can't even remember where I was going with that. No. Well, um, you know, I just kind of was asking. Oh, the carnivore diet. Is it good for kids? I would guess it probably is. I mean, I try to have – I try to give my sons as much meat as I can give them. And I'm not going to like, you know, I would never spank them anyway, but I'm not going to spank them if they don't eat it. You know, I'm not going to yell at them if they don't eat it. Mm. Um, They, you know, my older son has his own tastes and he loves apples. I mean, is that really that bad? Probably not. (laughs) Eat an apple, no big deal. And, you know, he can change when he's older. If he wants, you know, if he wants to go all meat, go for it. I will certainly support that. Right. Assuming I'm not dead by then or something. (laughs) You know, um, I think that apples would be a great thing for, you know, if that, if, if all of the things that a kid can have a taste for (laughs) or whatever, apples would be one of the less harmful things. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, and he likes popcorn and that's fine. So I just buy him like the best popcorn I can find. And that's his popcorn. Like, it's a little snack and no big deal. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even from, like, my sister has kids, and her oldest one right now just finished his first year of college. So, but, you know, now I have these young kids. And even from when, you know, that time difference, the – it's super easy to be healthy with kids. Mm -hmm. You know, you have – if you want, like, a high-protein snack for your kids, Epic Bars are fantastic. You know, they have – just like a like my son's favorite is a little lamb bar. It's lamb meat with I think currants and mint, and they're delicious. And they're and he loves them, and it's so good. And the, it's so convenient. It's a little. It's like a little protein bar, mm-hmm. and you throw it in your diaper bag or put it in your pocket or you know keep it in your car. And that just wasn't available even ten fifteen years ago. Mm-hmm. And you go to you know just go to any Whole Foods, and the there's so many easy options now. Yeah. And it's a shame that, you know, parents fall into this trap of, you know, cookies and juice. And it's, I think it's setting up kids for disaster, really. Yeah. But, you know, I, w- I was down that path and I recovered. So it's not impossible, but I think it's just making things harder. Yeah. And, I mean, you definitely make a good point that, you know, the tastes – that we are exposing our children to when they are younger. Like yeah. we're just kind of creating their tastes and preferences for what they're probably going to want as they get older. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you're, uh, you know, serving up the sweets and the cookies and the candy or whatever. And I, I'm not a parent. I can't imagine how difficult it would be to uh, try and prevent your kids from having the candies and the cakes and everything. Because all that just gets like it gets brought to school. Yeah. If there's like a party at the school or whatever, or somebody's yeah. birthday in class, uh, that stuff's just going to be everywhere. You know, but there has to be a certain amount of responsibility that we take, yeah. you know, in terms well, of what we're exposing them to. The best thing to do is just don't bring it in the house. Like if my – I know for a fact that – so my mom picked up my older son from school today, you know, because I'm here. And um, she, I think, took him to P. Terry's and got him a lemonade. Would I ever buy that for him? No. Is it like the worst thing? Absolutely not. But certainly it has ex- excess sugar in it. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to reprimand my mother. I'm not going to reprimand reprimand my son. It would be very weird to reprimand my mother. Wouldn't that be weird? That would be a little weird. Yeah. But, I mean, like, in certain (laughs) cases, I can imagine a situation where I would do that. You know, it's my kid. Anyhow, um, you know, so long as he doesn't associate – he associates that stuff as, like, treats and um, abnormal food, Mm -hmm. then I think that I've done a pretty good job. Yeah. At least a pretty good job. Um, But, you know, and, you know, you go to a birthday party, there's going to be cake. Give him a small piece. 
Yeah. Yeah. And if you're militant about it, you're probably just making a, you're just creating like a, an emotional attachment to that food at that point. Mm. And then it becomes an emotional eating. And then you're really setting them up for disaster. Yeah. I don't know. I kind of sometimes think of it as like cigarettes. Like, would you give your kid a cigarette? Of course not. You've, you would never do that. But are they going to get addicted from one cigarette? Probably not. Is it really going to hurt their health, just one cigarette? Probably not. So why give them cake and cookies every day? Like, that's genuinely going to hurt them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that's a bad analogy. Well, uh, no, I mean, I think it's a good analogy. And I think that, um, you know, it definitely is a good way of illustrating that, like, you know, you have this, like, very strong gut reaction about a cigarette. And you're like, yeah. no, God, of course not. I would never do that. Yeah. Um, and we should feel the same way about something with high fructose corn syrup in it yeah. and, you know, a bunch of weird processed junk. Yeah. Um, we should have that same, like, instant reaction that, like, no, of course I wouldn't give that to my kids. Yeah. Um, but realistically, that's, like, what most kids are are getting. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, I, you know, as people listen to this, I don't want people to feel bad about their parenting or, you know, if, if you recognize that, you could do better than do better. And I recognize every single day that I could do better. And I fail a lot of the times at doing better. But, you know, I still, I'm trying to, it's a, it's a constant effort. Mm -hmm. You know, I would never give my son a cigarette. Uh, and I would, you know, and I would more than likely, I would give him a cookie. Like if I, just so long as it wasn't a normal occurrence. Mm -hmm. Even though I know that it's bad for him. And part of it is just a societal thing. Like it's a – society would look at me like a, at a, as a terrible person if I get my kid a cigarette. But if I give him a cookie, it's socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. So there is that extra layer of complication with stuff like other toxins and cigarettes and poisons and whatnot. But, you know, a cookie – I could give my kid a cookie and nobody's going to bat an eye. And mm -hmm. they should more often I think is the right answer. Right. Maybe not always, but more often they should say – well, maybe we don't give the cookies this time. Yeah. I uh, think that there's a, a lot of um, shifting going on right now. Yeah, and, for sure. Um, definitely. Shows like yours, shows like mine, making an effort. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, hopefully, you know, in the coming uh, years, maybe we see this shift towards natural health and just being aware of what we're eating. You know, I think yeah. there's a lot of um, – you know, as I kind of mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different diets. There's a lot of ways of eating. But if we can just move towards more awareness of what we're eating um, and kind of regaining that connection with our body, our ability to know when we eat something and how it's making us feel. Yeah. Because um, so many people out there, I think, are, uh, you know, we have these kind of like long list of weird like symptoms and health things that we're experiencing or whatever. And yeah. um, it's becoming more common for people to look to the diet as a potential cause yeah. or a potential solution for those problems. Um, so I'm just hoping that things kind of continue in that direction. And as people become more aware and just more open to the information, um, hopefully people are able to improve their health. And we see some of these kind of major health problems starting to diminish rather than getting worse and worse every year. Yeah. I mean, the trend is definitely going that way. I, there was, you know, a, a different college girlfriend. Um, I, I mean, I can remember her and her sister and, you know, their her sister's boyfriend thinking that I was a crazy person for suggesting that diet might have – that might be playing a role in, you know, whatever health ailment was going on at the time with, for one of them. Um, and I was just – it was really confusing to me at the time. Like, why is that so, like, why is that such a crazy idea? It, mm. it didn't really register. And I know for a fact nowadays they don't think that way. But I think if you went to any college campus, you know, I shouldn't speak in absolutes, but, you know, you went to a college campus nowadays, it would definitely be more common for, you know, uh, any sort of, any regular, and you'd ask anybody, and they would probably agree that diet plays a role. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that has to do with social media, and the pitfalls of that are many. But you do get exposed to lots of new ideas, and like, sure, you see Instagram models that are, you know, <laughs> probably doing cocaine to stay thin, 
but they're also pretending at least a little bit to say this food is make is nourishing my body and look at me eat this big salad or whatever mm-hmm. and that's getting into the the psyche of uh this of of youth in that mm-hmm. Well, okay, maybe food is something else, right? And I'm glad they don't, you know, talk about the other part. But yeah, yeah. Well, there was there wasn't the reason why I bring that up is there was an Instagram model that came out as like had a big expose about like you know I was to maintain this Instagram body I was doing cocaine and like not oh, eating. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and that is not what all Instagram models do, clearly, but still. Right. Yeah. Um, And I think that you definitely, you know, point out something very important, which is that uh, hopefully the good portions of the message are coming through more strongly than the negative ones. Yeah. Um, Because there is a lot of – there are a lot of kind of unfortunate things (laughs) about the kind of social media craze right now. Yeah. Um, But I think you're right. I think it's also bringing a lot of benefit to people and – you know, hopefully at the end of the day, the benefit outweighs the negativity. Yeah. For lack of a better way of saying it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. Yeah. I think you said it right. For sure. The benefit weighs out, outweighs the negativity. Right. Positive outweighs the negative. <laughs> However. Yeah. So do you have any, I guess, closing thoughts for people who maybe after listening to this, maybe they're considering paleo or carnivore or... Something like that. Any closing thoughts on the topic? Jeez. Uh, um, don't give your kids cigarettes. Please don't do that. <laughs> um, and I, I, let's see. Closing thoughts. Well, um, no matter what you're doing, just make sure that you're happy doing it. I mean, if you can't laugh, then you're probably doing something wrong. Um, whether that be diet or exercise or anything you know just make sure you're having fun doing it and if you're not having you know find find the happiness somewhere you know what people might hear that and think well i don't like my job what am i going to quit i don't know not just but you know maybe your job would be you would feel better about your job if you had a better diet and your diet was making you feel better maybe it would be more tolerable i don't know um but as far as trying it i think it's worth a try Mm -hmm. i think it's and if you're not doing good, then stop and don't get married to it. Mm-hmm. Be willing to stop if don't, you know, I think there's a big pitfall there of you know, I've labeled myself as something. And so now I have to do it mm-hmm. or my friends will think I'm a, I don't know, a liar or a cheater or any other slew of negative mm-hmm. adjectives. You're just staying open-minded. Yeah. And if your friends think you're a liar, or cheater, or wish wishy washy, who cares? They'll get over it. Yeah. Or you'll find better friends. <laughs> yeah. Or even you know maybe you'll find better friends. But I mean I you know let's maybe you know not make people's lives more harder than, you know more difficult than they need to be. Your friends will get over it mm-hmm. for sure. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much for being here and sharing all of this with us. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I look forward to having you on the p- program again soon. I uh, Thank you. I, I really appreciate it, and I look forward to it, too. Awesome. I want to thank all of you for tuning in today, and I hope that you will leave us your comments down in the comment section below. If you're interested in learning more about Brad or more about People's Rx, you can visit peoplesrx.com. Or if you are in the Austin area, you can probably find a People's Pharmacy location and go check it out for yourself. I also invite you to check out Brad's podcast, the Cultivate Wellness Podcast, if you're interested in learning more holistic wellness and health information. Thank you again for checking out this video, and I hope to see you again very soon. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and I'll see you next time. If you'd like to see our premium yoga content, including 30-day programs and so much more, download Yoga Plus by Psyche Truth. It's available for Android and iPhone. You'll find links in the description of this video.